we flourishing today? Good. Unfortunately, however, our planet actually isn't. And it should come as no surprise to this audience that we human beings are largely to blame. Through our collective actions, we have changed the nature of our climate. We've poisoned the, the land, the waters, the oceans. Really, we've taken selfishly from this planet. And the more we've come to see ourselves as being separate from nature, the more destruction and decay we tend to leave in our wake. Now, there are many people, and they're usually men, will tell you that we can solve the world's great environmental problems through better economics or better technologies. I actually disagree. Fundamentally so. We need to change our... Oh, oh, wow. Thank you. I'll leave you. <laughs> we need to fundamentally change our thinking about who we are and how we fit on this planet. And to do so, we need new concepts within our language that make clear the fact that our own flourishing, our own well-being, is inherently connected to the flourishing of the environment around us. Now, before I go on, I'll tell you a little bit about me and what I do. So, I'm an aspiring academic based at Murdoch University. And, oh, some Murdoch Universians, hey! <laughs> Fantastic, some family in the house. I've got another one over here with Charles Roche. And um, yeah, so I'm really interested in the mental health impacts of environmental change and environmental degradation. And I became interested in this area of inquiry, as strange as it might sound, when I first became homesick. You see, when I was 18, I left my hometown of Albany to study up in Perth. So I moved to Perth when I was 18, and I absolutely hated it. Hated Perth, still don't particularly like it. Too big, too flat, too many people, too hard to get anywhere. I constantly felt anxious and I constantly felt upset. And I felt that way because I'd been taken out of a place that I knew and loved and cherished and had been plonked in an environment completely alien to me. Now, when I first started researching <coughs> homesickness, I found that the word homesick is actually a relatively new term for a much older ailment called nostalgia. So nostalgia was created back in 1688 by this bloke named Johannes Hoffer. He was a Swiss medical officer travelling with a garrison of men fighting a war on foreign soil. And what he observed was really interesting. He found that some of these men were missing their native homelands to such an extent that they'd become sick. They couldn't eat, they couldn't sleep. Their minds and bodies were failing them. And Hoffa feared that if these men weren't returned at once to their native homelands, that they could fall into a stupor and maybe even die. Hoffa also observed that there wasn't a word in the language that adequately captured what this ailment was. So he created the term nostalgia, which in its original form means the pain, the grief, the distress that is experienced when people are separated from a loved home place. At this point, you're probably thinking, Neville, really interesting stuff you got to say there, mate. Well done. But what does that have to do with human flourishing? Well, let me tell you. You see, what it says, what it speaks to, is the importance of our loved home environments, our loved places, for our mental health and well-being. If we become separated from such places, some of us will become sick, sometimes severely so. And indeed, nostalgia was recognised as a medically defined condition right up until the middle of the 20th century. Now, today, we've come a little bit hard-headed about these things. You know, homesickness isn't a medical condition, neither is nostalgia. But that does not mean that homes and other loved environments are no longer important for our emotional health and our psychological well-being. And in fact, the more that we destroy and degrade the environments around us, the more we begin to realise that the health of the mind is inherently contingent upon the health of the land upon which we dwell. 
Now, these connections between environmental health and mental health are perhaps most clearly seen amongst Indigenous communities living in places very vulnerable to climate change. Take, for example, the Inuit of Northern Canada. The Inuit's ancestral homelands are changing rapidly as a result of human-caused climate change. Average temperatures in that part of the world are rising twice as fast as they are anywhere else. And in February of this year, average temperatures were between 6 to 12 degrees warmer than the historical average. As a result, the sea ice is melting, the permafrost is thawing, and plant and animal cycles have been thrown into disarray. Now, from my perspective, the most remarkable part of all of this is the human response. On Baffin Island, the Inuit have started calling the weather Ugyanaktuk, a friend acting strangely, because it simply just doesn't make sense to them anymore. In other parts of northern Canada, people are uh, feeling dislocated and alienated from their homelands because they can't engage in cultural activities like they used to, such as hunting for seals on the sea ice or travelling across the permafrost to visit sacred sites. And what researchers are finding is that the Inuit are starting to feel a new form of environmental distress that is very reminiscent to homesickness. But what we have to remember is that the Inuit haven't left their homes. They haven't gone anywhere. Rather, as the global climate warms and shifts towards the poles, it's the Inuit's homeland that is leaving them behind. In short, what the Inuit are experiencing is a new form of homesickness called solastalgia. Solastalgia was developed by my mentor, the environmental philosopher Glenn Albrecht, to give voice to the sense of grief, pain and distress experienced by people who observe their home environments to be degrading around them. It's the homesickness one feels whilst they're still at home. Research is showing us that solastalgia is becoming an increasingly common human experience. It's not only been documented amongst the Inuit of northern Canada, it's been documented amongst the elders of the Torres Strait, amongst subsistence farmers living in rural Ghana, and as my research shows, it's even present right here amongst our family farmers in the West Australian wheat belt. This whole region, the southwest region of Western Australia, is becoming known as a climate change hotspot. We've lost upwards of 20% of our winter rainfall since the 1970s, and seasonal conditions are becoming much more variable. I mean, if it wasn't for Perth's desalination plants and groundwater reserves, water wouldn't be coming out of the tap. Now, you and I probably don't feel as though we're living in a particularly climate change environment, and that's because billion dollar investments in water infrastructure and water technology shield us from the worst of its impacts. But it's at this point that I ask you to spare a thought for our family farmers who are 100% dependent upon seasonal rains for their incomes and for their sense of place and mental well-being. And this is because the West Australian wheat belt isn't just an industrial landscape, it's a cultural landscape. The land provides farmers more than just their incomes, it's a repository of meaning and memory that are important for their sense of self-identity, their sense of purpose, for who they are. And it's for this reason that climate change poses such a great threat to the mental health of our farmers, because if the land begins to degrade, the mental health of our farmers begins to degrade with it. Since 2000, our farmers have experienced many more poor years than good. These consistently dry conditions are not only undermining the economic basis of family farming, it's also beginning to degrade the landscape. It's now possible to drive throughout large swathes of the West Australian wheat belt in early, early winter and see nothing but dry, dusty paddocks extending all the way to the horizon. Now, if you're a farmer that, that's grown up on that land, what does that feel like to live in a place that looks like this, to live in a home environment that looks like this? Well, let me tell you, this is what one farmer had to say to me. 
When there is no rain, the list of jobs is just When it's drought, you can cart water, cart food, go stand sheep up, go sell sheep, go shoot sheep, and go and watch your crops die. There's that sense of powerlessness. And then there's the dust. Agricultural landscapes, when they dry out, become susceptible to wind erosion, and that's because the ground cover dies, exposing the soil to the wind. And that can create large dust storm events, such as the one that hit Newtigate back in early 2012. That's my bed, by the way. Now, the thing is, in these really dry years, there's not a great deal that farmers can do to manage for wind erosion, but they still blame themselves for it. Not only do they see it as a management failure, they see it as symbolic of their own personal failings. To have your land blow is the antithesis of what it means to be a good farmer. And that's why when the wind begins to blow and the soil begins to drift away, I found that many farmers that I spoke to at least will take to shutting themselves inside, closing all the doors and windows, and drawing the curtains in an attempt to shield themselves or block themselves from an outside world that's become too painful to watch. Now, in many ways, people like the Inuit, people like Australian farmers are on the front line of environmental risks to their mental health and well-being. And that's because, unlike presumably most of us here today, their lives remain harnessed to the land and to the great cycles of nature. But I realised in preparing for this presentation that solastalgia has also become part of my life, but in a more subtle sort of way. Maybe you can relate to this, I, I don't know, but sometimes when I go walking through the bush or walking along the beach, all I can think about is rising sea levels and degrading reefs and desolated landscapes and drowning islands. And I've got to tell you, sometimes it just absolutely gets to me. I can see some people nodding their heads. Some people feel the same way. Solastalgia has become part of my own lived experience. I think it's becoming a more prominent part of the lived experience of people who are sensitive to the environment around them. But I'm not going to leave you on that note. I've got one more little story to tell, and I think it gets to the crux of what it means to flourish as a human being living on an ailing planet. When I was eight years old, my grandmother took me for a bushwalk up in the Prongrups, and we came upon a little spider orchid, much like the one up here that you see before me. Now, it wasn't the fact that we found that little spider orchid that has stayed with me all these years. Rather, it was the feeling that it gave me, because it was the first time I can remember thinking or feeling in an innate sort of way that that little plant, other plants like it, the animals, the mountain range itself are important for who I am and who I'd become. Of course, as an eight-year-old child, I couldn't articulate those feelings, but the older I've gotten, the more I've studied this area, the more I've come to see that there is an emerging language that gives a voice to these experiences. E.O. Wilson, the eminent biologist, would say that I experience biophilia, the love of life. Yifu Tuan, the humanist geographer, would say that I had experienced topophilia, the love of place. And Glenn Albrecht might say that I experienced euteria, a feeling of oneness with the earth and its life cycles. I now make a point of going up and visiting my little awkward friends as much as I can because I know how important these emotional experiences are to my own well-being, my own flourishing in a way. But more importantly, what these experiences remind me is that I'm connected to this place and that I am part of, rather than apart from, the living systems of the earth. And that in turn motivates me to tread a little bit more lightly upon this landscape and to appreciate the intrinsic value of our remnant bushland. So my advice for how to flourish as a human being living on an alien planet is actually really simple. Don't run away from solastalgia. 
And don't shut yourself off from feeling biophilia, topophilia, uteria. Actively seek to experience these emotions and then let them move you, to permeate you, to change you. Let them guide your actions, inform your politics. It might sound like a small thing, but I think it's profound because these little experiences remind us that we are all part of the living, breathing fabric of the earth. Thank you very much.